Hi, everybody. My name is Isha, and today I'm going to be talking about how and why we should make meat in a lab. But before we get into that, I thought it'd be really important to tell you who I am and where I came from, because usually when I tell people that my life's work is about making meat in a lab, they're like, who are you and where did you come from? So I'm going to start with where I'm from. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and I thought nothing could summarize this place better than this bumper sticker. So Alberta is the biggest industry there is the oil and gas industry, and another secondary very huge industry there is livestock production. And so when I grew up in this place, which was very much about trucks and beef, um, this is kind of what life looked like in Edmonton. So you spend all your life essentially on the road, going from place to place, dependent on your car, and I grew up completely hating car culture. But it's kind of weird because on the other hand, I grew up completely loving eating meat and consuming beef in particular. So much that me and my friends would eat steak tartare every Tuesday for half price at this restaurant called Accent. And I was looking up this restaurant on Google Maps and it is exactly perfect because you can't even see the restaurant because it is blocked by a gigantic black truck. So this is essentially a summary of my experience growing up in Edmonton. Um, let's flash forward a couple years, and I'm here at the University of Alberta. This screen is so big that you can actually see this yellow building, which is called the Butter Dome, which is something I like to share. Um, but at this university, I was doing a degree in cell and molecular biology, when in my fourth year, I decided almost at random to take a course focused on meat science. And the reason why I wanted to do that is obvious, because I absolutely loved meat but also because everybody cares about meat. It's really hard to talk about signaling pathways or protein structures to people, um, but you can absolutely talk about food to absolutely anybody. So I took this meat science class, and it, it essentially changed my whole life trajectory. And that's because my poultry science professor in the first couple classes told me these numbers which I thought were completely shocking. The first was that livestock production is accountable for 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So I had kind of grown up thinking that livestock and farming was really good for the environment and kind of like a cyclical thing, but what was actually happening was that so much of climate change was because we were raising 60 billion animals per year to serve the needs of about 7 billion people. But that number was not really as shocking as knowing that worldwide transportation is only 14%. So all this time where I had been hating the, essentially the wrong industry in this place where I was growing up, and that we actually should be looking at changing livestock and maybe not so much car culture if we want to create a big impact when it comes to mitigating climate change. And of course, there's so much more that I learned about livestock production, like how environmentally unfriendly it is. I mean, it's a huge contributor to water pollution like this huge uh, algae bloom that has damaged a lot of waterways. It's also a public health threat. I mean, the number of epidemic viruses that are created and antibiotic resistance, and of course, foodborne illness is a huge, huge problem. And then there's the most obvious kind of ethical conundrums that come with eating so many animals. I mean, we've become extremely efficient at producing a lot of animals to feed a lot of people, but as we become more efficient, what happens is there's usually some kind of compromise when it comes to animal welfare. So I was wondering what we were supposed to do about this, and of course, my professor presented me with the solution just a few classes later, where he put this slide on the board, and it completely blew my mind. The idea that instead of raising a whole chicken and cutting off its beak and pulling out its feathers and taking off its legs and whatever, just for a boneless, skinless chicken breast, which is usually what people are eating in North America, we could actually start just with a chicken cell, multiply that chicken cell out into a muscle tissue, and then consume that tissue. And when I was presented with this idea, I mean, this is basically the summary of all the amount of research that had gone into it. It was a completely, completely brand new idea. But I decided that I was gonna completely focus my efforts into making this thing a reality because I thought it was so promising and so neglected. So let's fast forward another few more years after a master's and working in pharma and a couple other things. And this is my house in Toronto where I decided on January 14th, 2013 that I was going to be completely full-time dedicated to making cultured meat a thing. And it was quite hard because I was just by myself, alone, 
wondering how I was ever going to fund essentially high-tech biotech research as a non-wealthy individual. <laughs> so I thought about this quote from Carl Sagan. He says, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So what I realized I had to do was essentially invent the universe, but I had to create a universe from which cultured meat could arise. And so I did what anyone who wants to build a universe does. I went to the internet, and I found a bunch of people who really cared about making this happen. So some of these people were contributing in terms of philanthropic contributions, donations to give money towards research. Some of these people were researchers themselves. And for about a year, I spent my time building this community. And then by the second year, I, th I thought, OK, it's time to actually do some real science. And that's where I brought together these two guys, Ryan and Paramal. They were from the New Harvest Universe. And we decided that we were going to make milk using a yeast culture. So we were going to take the genes for milk proteins, put them into yeast, and then use industrial fermentation in order to produce milk without cows. And Mufri ended up being very successful. Uh, they actually exist today, and now they're called Perfect Day. Uh, I encourage you to check out their website. They're going to have a product in the market next year. And what was cool is we were able to create this project almost out of nothing, and also kind of because synthetic biology was a hot thing, and we were doing what all the cool kids were doing and starting companies. But <laughs> we also decided to do the same thing not too much later after, where we decided to create another company called Clara Foods that was also going to be making proteins using industrial fermentation, but these time egg proteins. Now, this was the point where the universe had to expand a little bit, because I realized that it wasn't so much about just creating meat in a lab. It was actually about creating any animal product in a lab. So there's kind of two categories of animal products. There's your milk and your eggs, which are not cells. They're not living. They're just a combination of proteins and fats, really. And because they're just a combination of proteins and fats, we can use existing technologies to create them at scale. So there's kind of already a universe in which milk and eggs can be made because we already make so many other food ingredients and so many other pharmaceutical products that way. But there's this other category of food products, which are tissues. That's like this ham and this salmon and this shrimp, where it's actually made of cells that have grown out into tissues. And unfortunately, there isn't quite a universe for that yet. There isn't a body of expertise that we can build from. There isn't a huge amount of research that we can build off of. So what we had to do was kind of create a community in which that would be built. So I went back to the quote and thought, OK, what do we need to do now for cultured meat? And I realized that the very first thing that we had to do was build a field of research. And I, I ascribed that quote to me, but it actually wasn't the quote. I mean, it wasn't me that came up with this idea. It was actually the whole community of people that we'd be building over the past couple of years. So I went to our Facebook group and said, what are we going to call this field of research where we can make any kind of agricultural product from a cell culture instead of from a plant or animal? And that's where we came up with the idea of cellular agriculture, which is pretty self-explanatory by this point. So for cultured meat, how on earth are we going to get this started? So we have the people in the universe, and we have a little bit of funding, but what's missing? So I thought I'd walk through this slide that goes through kind of the four main elements of producing cultured meat. The first thing you need to start with is your cells. So when you're producing something like chicken, beef, pork, you need to have chicken, beef, and pork cells. And those are probably going to be muscle cells, but they could also be fat cells. They could also be other cells like fibroblasts that might contribute to texture or things like that. And the challenge with these kind of cells is that they don't exist yet. So if you're a tissue engineer, you've probably worked with mouse cells, you've probably worked with human cells, but it's very, very unlikely that you've ever worked with the cells from an agricultural animal, just because we've never had the demand for producing food-oriented cells. So that represents like a huge black hole when it comes to making cellular agriculture a real thing. The second thing that you need is a scaffold. So muscle cells are particular in that they need to attach onto a surface in order to grow and mature into fibers like the meat that we're very familiar with. And right now, scaffolding materials are 
either expensive or they're not edible or they don't come from a sustainable source. And that's again because our ex experience in tissue engineering is very focused on medical kind of things. So there's another black hole there where we need to find out scaffolds that are inexpensive and easy to grow on at, that the muscle cells will actually want to grow on too. And then the, there's a third element, which is the medium. So the medium is kind of like the food for the cells. It provides all the nutrients and the amino acids, et cetera, that the cells need to grow and divide and multiply. Right now, medium comes from fetal calves, which is a completely unsustainable source when it comes to producing animal products without animals. And the problem is that people have been using this fetal bovine serum just because it's like a magic ingredient. It just works really, really well, but no one really knows why. And so another thing that we absolutely have to solve is coming up with a food for the cells that is completely sustainable and animal free. And I think not only would that be useful for cellular agriculture, but it'll also be useful for all the other things that we need tissue engineering for. And then lastly, we need a bioreactor. And this is not so much of a black hole because we already use bioreactors for all kinds of huge things like making the milk and egg proteins that I mentioned earlier. So I realized if we wanted cultured meat to be a thing, we already had the people, we had a little bit of money, but what was missing were these research tools, these kind of elements of producing cultured meat that just didn't exist yet. So we decided to start making them. Uh, right here is Dr. Paul Moziak. He's a researcher from North Carolina. And when he first entered the New Harvest universe, I found out some interesting things about him. One was that he had been wanting to do this research for 23 years, but just had no means of doing it. He had been actually keeping a culture of turkey cells since 1993 because he was so desperately wanting to make cultured meat. The problem was that he wasn't getting funding from any of his existing funders, and he couldn't find a lot of people who were excited to collaborate with him. The good thing was we had all those things, and so we came to Dr. Paul and decided together that the most useful catalytic project he could do was to create the very first turkey cell line, which we could then disseminate to researchers all over the world so we could begin kind of creating a culture of people working on creating cultured meat. So this is Marie Gibbons. She's a New Harvest Research Fellow and Dr. Paul's graduate student. And she's creating these turkey cells. We just got this photo a little while ago. Um, and she's creating them in culture so that we can send them to people all over the place. So that's a picture of her with a huge number of cryotubes of turkey cells that we're sending to whoever wants them. And the cool thing is, after Marie isolates these cells and starts shipping them out, she's going to actually start working towards making those cells even better for making cultured meat so that they can be used in this bioreactor. So she's going to try and design the cells so they can be grown in suspension so we can grow a lot of cells very quickly. We also have some researchers who are developing the scaffolding materials that I mentioned earlier and trying new different materials that cells can attach onto and grow into. And I, I was so, okay, the thing that I love about being able to start from scratch and the ability to create a new universe is that you can actually design the universe that you want. And I went back and thought about how food technology has changed people and food over the years, and was wondering how we should model cellular agriculture in particular. And so I thought I'd walk through kind of these two big changes when it came to food technology. The first one, food tech version 1.0, is fermentation. And fermentation absolutely expanded our world of what foods could be. I mean, just looking at the example of milk, before fermentation, we just had milk. After fermentation, we had how many hundreds of cheeses and yogurts and kefirs and delicious types of foods that were created independently in different countries all over the place. And how many people use fermentation as like a sharing thing, like you can share your sourdough culture with anybody, you can share your kombucha mother, you can buy one off Craigslist. Actually, you don't even have to buy one, you can just exchange them on Craigslist. So fermentation was something that kind of opened up this whole realm of new foods, and I think that's largely because it was so openly accessible to anybody. And that's also because it's very easy to share cultures between people to try new things. But then compare that to kind of food tech version 2.0, which are GMOs. Now, GMOs are kind of really, really hard to share, and that's kind of because the science is so complicated. So think about golden rice, for example, which is a GMO rice that is vitamin A enriched. The reason why that's having a hard time getting 
to people is because it's held up in 70 patents held by 32 different companies. And that's because it's just really hard to do complicated science like that and make it freely available to everybody because so many different people have to agree to make it open. So how are we going to do this with cellular agriculture? Because cellular agriculture is kind of like GMOs in that there are so many moving bits and pieces and so many opportunities to create IP. But if we want to, in fact, open this world to more innovation, more iterations of what meat can be, we have to probably try to go as open as possible. So that's when I decided that New Harvest probably wasn't going to go to the direction of creating companies like uh, Mufri and Clara Foods anymore, but instead focus on completely uh, open, publicly accessible knowledge. And the way that we're going to do that, in addition to the grants that we've given to people like Dr. Paul and Marie, are to build our own lab where everything created in the lab is going to be open source. It's probably going to be really hard to keep everything in cellular agriculture open, but we're going to try our best to make sure that everything we create is going to be open. So this lab is at here in Paris at Lafayette, which probably lots of you know about already. And that's Dan, who's sitting right there, who's going to be our first researcher that is working there. So I know I didn't get to go into the technical details too much about how cultured meat is made, and that's largely because they don't exist yet. But I did want to share with you how we are able to create a universe and how when you bring together a whole bunch of people who want to contribute something, whether that be their philanthropic dollars to support researchers or people's own expertise and own passions, you are able to, in fact, create an apple pie. And these are the apple pies that we've been creating so far. Uh, a little tiny turkey nugget, <laughs> some egg proteins, and milk in cell cultures. Thank you. <laughs>